Hello and welcome to another Pro Tipster Tennis Podcast. I'm joined again by our tennis expert, Pro Tipster Johnny, and we're going to have a chat about general betting in tennis, and of course we'll be looking at the Aussie Open as well. But first, Johnny, you've set a challenge. You want to give me a quiz? Hello everyone, and hello Paddy. Yes, uh, I have a surprise for you. To You usually give questions to me, but this time I decided I will give you a, a few questions and I will test your knowledge, not just from the Australian Open. Jeez. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. It's, it's gonna be a lot, lot of fun. You, we, you will see. It's gonna be embarrassing. <laughs> I don't think so. I right. don't think so. Let's do it. Most, yeah. Okay. So I've got nine questions and I might have one extra one if you do well. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> okay. We'll start very easily. Who won the 2017 Australian Open, both in men and women's draw? So that's last year. Oh, t- I have no idea. I'm going to guess here. Uh, I wouldn't mind, but you probably said it last week. Uh, did Halep win it last year? No. Mm, no. no. Okay. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. Let, let's start with the men's, men's draw. It's a big name and it's, he's also the biggest favorite to win in this. Ah, year. so, the, uh, Djokovic. No, no. Federer. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. It, it was Roger Federer for the men. Okay. For the women's, I'll give you another hint. She's not playing this year because she gave a birth to a child a few months oh, ago. Serena Williams. Exactly. Hurrah! Half a we point. got there. Got there. Question number two. Okay. So it's a it's a yes or no answer. Yes. Was Australian Open always played on a hard course? Oh. Yes oh, or no? See. Um. Uh, I'm gonna have to use a bit of logic here because uh, it's probably like an old colonial type of thing with ties back to Britain, grass, Britain, Wimbledon. So I'm going to say no. Uh, your answer is correct. Uh, Aussie Open was played on grass until 1988. Huh. So it's not even that long ago. Yeah, 1988. I was not even born by that time. Oh, you child. I was, I was seven. <laughs> I was watching, I was, I was watching Ray Houghton score goals against England in the, <laughs> in the Euros. <laughs> um, question number three. How was Australian Open previously called? Just look, just, I give you a hint. Just use a bit of logic. It's not, it's not that difficult at all. How was Australian Open previously called? Uh, the, the Sydney Open? Ah, oh. uh, try another one. Just use a, the first word, keep the first word. Aussie Open? There. <laughs> no. <laughs> keep the first, keep the first word there. Just replace the open with something. And if you, if you think Australian. a bit, then you, I think you can get it. The Australian Grand Slam. The Australian. Oh, okay. I will not. The uh, Australian you Tennis anymore. Tournament. The Australian oh, oh. Fun and Happy Times Tournament of Tennis. <laughs> the Australian was... Drinking Beer and <laughs> Barbecue you, tennis. You got it, Pat. You got it, Pat. This is the, this is the one. <laughs> okay, so the Aussie Open was called from 1905 until 1969 Australian Championship. Ah, it's so simple. <laughs> yeah, I, I said I'm not going to give you a difficult questions. Uh, I'm not. Sorry. Question, question number four. Was the tournament always been played in Melbourne? Yes or no? No. Yeah, this is a very correct answer. The tournament is played in, in Melbourne in, uh, from 1987. Until then, it was played all over Australia in different cities. Uh-huh. Okay, getting to more difficult questions, man. But you've done well so far. What was the warmest Australian Open ever? I give you three <laughs> possibilities. I give you three possibilities. Johnny. A, okay. so A, 2010. B, 2009. And C, 2016. Ah, uh, nah, heat wave. I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm going through the, the the banks of memory in my brain <laughs> for uh, when did when did Australia have a heat wave? Mm, let me let me think. <laughs> Every year. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, the second one, 2010, was it? Yeah, the second one was 2009. So 2010 or 2009? Oh, now now it's one of them, and now I'm all messed up. Uh, no, I'll stick, I'll stick with the second one. So 2009, yeah. and you're correct. Boom! It was 2009, and the average temperature was 34.7 oh, Celsius, degrees God, imagine Celsius. Irish people, yeah. Irish people melt when it's over 18. 
<laughs> That's why they don't play in Australia. <laughs> <don't> play tennis. <laughs> Question number six. According to the Australian Open policy, what is the temperature beyond which the matches are stopped? So when is the, when are the there is a temperature level when the matches are stopped because of the heat? Oh, so it's probably it's, something mental because it's Australians like yeah. forty two. The correct answer is forty. Ah, oh, wasn't that far? Oh well. Although we will speak about it today, the temperatures actually today are quite high. So I think it's yeah, it's it's just case by case. Mm-hmm. Question number seven, and this is also a difficult one, but let's see. How long did the longest Grand Slam final in Melbourne uh, has has been played? So how long it, it was played? Uh, I give you a hint which match it was, and and it's it was a really long match, so don't don't guess anything beyond three hours or even four. So it was a it was a two thousand and twelve final between Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic, where Djokovic won his second Australian Open title. So I want to know how long the match was. <sighs> Let me see. Um... You said not four, not no, definitely more. Oh, more, much, oh, so much looking, more. Well, we're looking at. We'll say uh, these things do go on long anyway. So five, maybe five. I, I'm going to put a random number. So five hours, fifteen minutes. Almost there, Paddy. Almost there. You're improving. It was five hours and fifty-three minutes. So nah, I, was, I wasn't that close, Johnny. <laughs> no, nah, come on. But it's good. It was a good. It was a good. good it was a good answer for your thanks, standards. Thanks, man. thanks very much. <laughs> thanks that uh, passive-aggressive note there in your voice. <laughs> Question number eight. How many balls are used every year? I mean, tennis balls. <laughs> every year at every at the Australian Open. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Many. It's more. It's more than twenty thousand, <laughs> and less and less than sixty thousand. <laughs> uh, Forty-five thousand. Almost there, Paddy. You're you're so good. Forty thousand balls. Not bad. Give me half a point for that. Yeah, half a pint. Half a pint, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ten in the morning, woohoo! <laughs> and the last question. Um, there is only one player who won the tournament both on grass and hard course. This is a difficult question, but I'll give you a hint again. This person or this player, is it's a male player, so it's a guy, it's a man. Now he works for Eurosport, and he has a, fav- and he has a show on Eurosport called... Game set and mats, or now they call it game shed and mats. And I think he's Swedish, and I want to know the name. Swedish tennis player who played in the, when did you say it stopped being grass? The 80s. Yeah. Um, game set and match, so is that a clue? Ma- game, se- game set and mats is mats. the, so uh, because mats, mats something. Yeah. Yes, it, it's his first name exactly. Uh, Mats, 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 Mats. Ah, oh, no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm resisting Google here. I have the Google open in front of me, and I'm not going to cheat. I've no <laughs> idea, Mats. I don't uh, remember. I don't remember. This is going to kill me. I should know this. Mats. Tannenbaum, Tenen. Mats. His, his surname starts with W. W. Mats Vavrinka. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I give up. Okay. I give up, Johnny. So it's Mats Villander. Mats Villander. Mats Villander, yeah. He has a show on Eurosport, like he works for Eurosport for, ah, for a few, yeah, few, I see him for, now. I, I'm just for gonna... a few years and, uh, now he's doing the show with, uh, Barbara Shett. She's yeah. also a former player. So now they call it Game Shett and Mats, but it was called Game Set and Mats before when he did the show with Annabelle Croft. So well, the worst thing is, I, I just Googled it now, and yeah, I recognize him. I've, I've seen him on your sport. Damn you, memory. Damn you. How did I do? Johnny, what was my score? Uh, it was uh, pretty impressive. Let's not count the correct answers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, Let's get into why we're here. Look, uh, before we start, though, uh, properly, Johnny, uh, just tell everyone where you are on social media, please. So you can find me uh, on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, both handles are Prodipster Johnny. 
And you can find me at Pro Tipster Pod because I look after all the podcasts here at Pro Tipster and the videos as well. And uh, you can get in touch with all of us, uh, well, all of us English speakers on Pro Tipster anyway, over at the UK uh, Facebook page. So facebook.com and have a look for Pro Tipster UK. So we have some groups there, tennis groups, uh, basketball, American sports, and of course British and European football as well. So look, uh, obviously we're going to talk about the the Aussie Open, but uh, we want to have a little chat, a little more general chat about actually betting on tennis. So look, uh, uh, Johnny, every, everyone talks about uh, betting on value these days and finding value. And okay, everyone's definition of value is different, but as long as as long as you know what value is yourself, then um, then you can kind of you can kind of stick to, to 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 certain parameters, you know. And so, when you're looking for value, then what do you look for? This is a, this is a good good question, Paddy. Especially especially about tennis. I have a few examples which I picked out from recent matches at the Aussie Open from round two, mostly. Um, the players that were priced above three, above five odds, like really high odds, and they won their matches. Now, looking for value doesn't always mean that you just pick the, the the players with the highest odds. Obviously, it doesn't work this way. Ideally, you should you should make a estimation yourself. What would what would you, what would your price be for for each player and the probability of a uh, of the player of your players to to win? Uh, I have a good example from uh, I have a good example from 2014 final. Yeah, it's 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 a three years back. Uh, okay, it was Stan Wawrinka playing Rafael Nadal. Rafael Nadal had a was finally getting back from his injuries. He was really playing well, and he was really good fa- favorite to win win the game. He was one point eighteen, sixteen eighteen depends on which bookies you take to win to win the final. Stan Wawrinka was priced around five point five. Odds to win the tournament, which represented at that time a really great value, but lots of people underestimated Stan Wawrinka because he lost the 12 previous matches against Rafael Nadal. Stan Wawrinka went on and won this final, and uh, he lifted his first Australian Open title. What I was going to try to say: you need to make estimation of price yourself, and if if the offered price is higher. And it obviously, it represents a value. Mm. Uh, to do this, you need to. In tennis, you've got only two um, two options: it's either player one wins or player two wins. Uh, you there is no draw like in football, which makes it uh, which makes it easier. So let's say you say Nadal has uh, for you has ninety percent chance of winning this, and Savarinka has ten percent chance of winning this, saying that. You you think that Nadal would win this uh, match in nine out of ten cases, and you see five point five for for Vavrinka. Well, I think then then it's not the, then it's not the the, the the best value for for you. But if you think that uh, Vavrinka can win, let's say three or four times out of ten matches, then five point five seems pretty good. Mm. So, few examples from. Last few rounds, uh, when Nicolas Kicker from Argentina was uh, 5.5 to beat uh, Lucas Latsko. Okay, this was this was a price that for me was a value, but a lot of people jumped on Lucas Latsko because you remember in our first podcast uh, he beat. We were saying that he eliminated uh, Milos Raonic, Raonic, one of the favorites. So obviously, people were tending to put money on him. So Nicolas Kicker won won the match very easily. Another example we got uh, Pavrinka, who was uh, yesterday who was eliminated by uh, the American Sangren. Surprisingly, the odds were for the Americans started at four point three three or something like that, and dropped to three point twenty five because there were rumors about uh, Pavrinka's injury. So, and if, obviously, it helps if you follow the matches and if you see some matches or at least read a lot and see the highlights. Vavrinka was not so, 
so good in the first first round. You could see that he was struggling with the movement a bit. So this was also quite a value. And then, last but not least, the example got Marcher played Verdasco and eliminated him in five sets, and the odds were around three three fifty again, uh, which seemed to be a value. And we've got an example from for for a British player, Conta, who played uh, Para. Uh, we will speak about this a bit later, but the odds for the para to win, and she unfortunately for Conta won, was, were six. Again, uh, for the state that Conta is in, that there were rumors about her injury, that, that was also a bit of value. Thanks for listening to the Pro Tipster Football Show. Check out ProTipster.com where you can earn money by sharing your tips and coupons. Sign up now and get our free daily newsletter where our experts share their tips. Go to protipster.com for more details. When it comes to like Asian handicaps or, or, or price, well, no, you already mentioned uh, price jobs. When it comes to Asian yeah. handicaps, what, what, what should you be looking at then? And what kind of, you know, cause, cause, cause I had, I had a, a, an Asian handicap video to do with football and it's over on YouTube and it was a strategy and it was going quite well. I, I and, uh, and, but as it went on, you could see that it, that it wasn't working because you know yourself, the strategies, you have to change them around and, you can't always follow one uh, to, 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 to be good at betting. There's no the holy grail s- single strategy, you know. Um, but with, uh, the handicap for that football video, it was, I had to use very strict, uh, odds for the parameters to find uh, which matches to bet on. Uh, what kind of, um, so uh, for example, uh, going like over a handicap of minus two was, uh, very unlikely to win. You know, things like that. So what kind of handicaps do you need to look for uh, with the strongest players? Uh, I would say this way. The, t- the trick with the Asian handicap, it helps sometimes, but it's very tricky with tennis. Because let's be honest, the, 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 the player doesn't really care if he wins the set 6-3, 6-4, 7-5, 6-0, as long as, as he or she wins the set. So... The Asian handicap might be very tricky. I'll use examples from my own uh, bets on Prodipster. You can find me also on Prodipster as Prodipster Johnny. Uh, today I picked uh, Andrei Rublev against Dimitro uh, on a, on positive Asian handicap of, of 3.5 against Grigor Dimitro. Okay, the match finished in four sets, and counting all the one games, I lost the bet because of one game. So I needed Rublev to win. Uh, to win maximum three less games than Dimitrov, but he he won four less games than Dimitrov, so it was very unlucky. I needed basically for him to to win one more one more game, but it didn't come through because uh, yeah. So the Asian handicap might be sometimes very tricky. Because, as I said, the players, you know, for for the player, it's most important to win the game. And the motivation to beat the Asian handicap, he, he doesn't care. Yeah. He, he, he's not allowed to bet. Well, most <laughs> of them. <laughs> <laughs> so another example uh, from from tonight. I had Alice Cornet played uh, Elise Mertens. I had a positive handicap on uh, Alice Cornet. Now I'm just looking what, what 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 was the handicap. I think it was also 3.5. Yeah, plus 3.5 on Alice Cornet. Uh, she, she, she lost in straight sets to Mertens, uh, both sets by two games. So in total, she lost the match by four, four games. So again, it was, I needed one more game for her to win, to, to win this bet. So it was very unlucky. So what I do, uh, I don't, te- I don't tempt to pick, uh, favorites with a uh, huge handicaps because, you know, even if Nadal is playing, for example, now Nadal is playing, uh, uh, Jumur, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, guys. Yeah, Jumur from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I think the handicap was, was quite high for uh, eight or nine games or something like that for Nadal. Okay, he's now leading 2-0. He's won the first set 6-1, the second one 6-3. So it pro- would probably come through because I'm expecting him to win the third set. But it can happen what happened yesterday to Federer. Federer was playing, uh, German Stroff. And he only won by five games because it was 6-4, 6-4, and 7-6. So it was a pretty close match uh, for such a favorite. 
So this can be quite tricky. Uh, I would advise to pick more on, on the winners of the match than the Asian handicap. What I tend to do, the Asian handicap is a value when, when it comes to underdogs and a positive uh, Asian handicap when you really expect the, the, the underdog to, to put a big fight and, uh, make, make the match quite a close one. Then the other, uh, alternative to Asian handicap Handicap on, on games would be Asian handicaps on set handicap. When you, you know, when you expect an underdog to take at least one set or two sets and the odds are good for that. Yeah. But John, isn't, uh, isn't the, the problem though that, you know, the, the favorites, they're always, they're, uh, you know, very much, the the odds are always very, you know, they're particularly low. Like you can have a Vrenka who can be like 1.2 and stuff like that, and, and betting and stuff like that, it's it's quite hazardous. Yeah, well, betting on the favorites, uh, especially on big favorites, uh, I don't think it has any value if you if you bet on odds of one point one or one point two. Even in, even in accumulators, it's uh, it's quite risky. Mm. I mean, oh, of course they usually win, but then you got this uh, big surprises, and these Australian Open is quite good for surprises, and uh, it can ruin all your all your effort uh, which you put into the research and into your accumulator or into your betting. As you probably know, podcasts still grow by word of mouth. Show your support for the Pro Tipster Football Show by telling your football mad friends all about our podcast or by leaving a nice review for us on iTunes. And so like what kind of like is, is maybe then the best value in, 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 in betting on outright markets? Outright markets are a bit uh, different. I mean, uh, it, we're talking about the winning, let's say, the tournament or the quarter of the uh, the quarter of the draw. Uh, uh, like, we, I'll use the example from this OZ Open. Obviously, Roger Federer was the favorite to win this tournament at 2.75. Uh, I mean, he won the tournament five times, and he was uh, he was the only one from the let's say the big guns. Speaking about the traditional big guns, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, Murray, uh, who was not injured last season. So he had a good rest, he had good, good preparations. Uh, looking at the outright market now, he is still around 2.75, 2.8 because he proved uh, his qualities, he, um, he won the matches pretty easily. Let's say he didn't really struggle. So there was no really shift in the odds. For example, Novak Djokovic was 6.5 to, to win the tournament. Uh, be, because there were some concerns about his elbow injury and how he can, how he can do. And looking at the odds now, it also stays the same because, uh, he proved his, he seems to be fit, but obviously there are some concerns if it comes, when it comes to long matches and difficult matches, how he can do. Because he's got the, I don't know if you saw, but he's got his, he had to, uh, he had to make a new way of serving or adapt his serving me- method to, to his elbow. So it, it looks a bit different than he used to serve, but uh, it, it brings him success so far. Mm. Um, so yeah, speaking about outrights, uh, outrights are fine to, to pick. Uh, obviously for, for me, Personally, I don't like the long-term bets. I mean, if I have to wait for two weeks uh, <laughs> for, for for a bet, uh, well, when you bet, when you pick an outright, you hope to w- to wait for uh, for two weeks. You hope not to be it lost for in the on the first day or second day. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for example, Stan Wawrinka was 34 odds of 34 to to win the tournament, and you can see why he was eliminated in round two. Mm. Rafael Nadal was 5.00 to win. Uh, now he's 3.75. It uh, got a bit low. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, it dropped a bit because he's playing really well and he seems to be really, really fit and really confident. Uh, yeah. So that, that's the story with the men's. Uh, we can, we can just briefly mention the women's because obviously that's, that's really difficult to, to pick, uh, who's going to win in, uh, in the women's draw. There were, like three favorites at 9.00 to win. Simona Halep, Alina Svitolina, and Karolina Pliskova. And looking at the odds right now, Svitolina is 5.00, Pliskova is 7.00, Halep is 7.5, so a bit, bit of drops. Because you've got 
few seats out from the top 10. You've got uh, Conta, unfortunately, out for Britain fans. You've got Venus Williams, Coco Van Der Weyck, uh, and yeah, that's about it from the from the women's. Outright bets are long-term bets. Obviously, you need to have a good overview of also of the draw, who can possibly play who, in which stage of the competition, and who can be potential opponents for your favorite. So then I have to ask you then, who who <laughs> who are your tips then if uh, for an outright? Like if you had to pick an outright now, who who would you be going for in in, in both tournaments? Ah, uh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> obviously, for, obviously for the men, I I'm expecting a Federer, a Federer Nadal final, which I think would be the best final at the moment. The first player, the, the number one, against the number two. For the women's, it's it's more difficult. I mean, I would I mean I would love to see Halep uh, against. Wozniacki final, or as I mentioned, both of them, they didn't win a grand slam so far, and I think they would both, both deserve it. So, if they both stay fit, I would love to see this, and then who wins, I don't really mind. Just, it would be great to, for one of them to, to finally win a grand slam. Mm-hmm. Well, fair enough. Um you mentioned there as well, during the quiz, the unpredictability of, 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 of the women's game. Um, can you give us a few more examples of that? Yeah, I uh, just wanna, I, I mentioned it in the first tennis podcast that we did that the women's game is much more unpredictable than men's. So therefore, for, for trading or for betting is, uh, for trading actually is not, is good, but for betting, uh, for picking winners and it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, I'll use a few examples. From round two, I watched the match uh, of uh, Australian Gavrilova playing uh, Mertens. It was a match that was started at after midnight, and I want to ask you, Paddy, did you ever play a sport, a game of sports uh, after after midnight? <laughs> you asked this on Twitter, and I answered honestly. Uh, um, <laughs> Do you really want me to say this to people? Yeah, um, it wasn't really a sport, but uh, we decided. One, uh, it was about 4 a.m. one morning in Tesco car park in close to where I'm from. We decided to play some jousting and, uh, so, so I was in a shopping trolley with my brother pushing me. He was the horse and I had a traffic cone as my, um, oh, what are they called? The jousting stick. I don't know what they're called. And, uh, yeah, so we kind of, yeah, there was four of us involved and, uh, yeah, we yeah, we all ended up crashing on the ground, and I, I really wish we had the CCTV footage. But uh, at the same time, I'm also thankful there were no camera phones back then. <laughs> That's probably the only sport sport in inverted commas I've ever played at, uh, after midnight jousting. Yes, I have jousted. <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> all right, so yeah, yeah, this match was so Gabrielova Merton started after midnight. Which is, for me, it would be quite late. So, if, you know, if you have to, wait, although you know you're playing in the uh, night session, but you, you, and you expect kind of to play late, maybe so nine, ten, but you probably don't expect to no, play. No, not that late. No. Midnight, and you have to wait all day for the match. It's quite. I, I think it has to be quite difficult. So, but the story, what I was going to say, Gavrilova was leading against Mertens five nil in the first set. She was, I think, she was serving for the for, for the win in the first set. She lost seven games in, games in a row to lose the set 5-7. So Mertens won seven games in a row to win the set 7-5 and, and then the whole match. And then the whole match. So that was quite, uh, that was quite, uh, it was, it was 7-5 and 6-3 in the end. That was amazing comeback from, uh, the Belgium Mertens. And that just so shows that uh, how mental state of or, or healthy mind and psychology works in, in sports like tennis, where you have to rely on yourself. Yeah. Because until five nil, everything was was good for Gabrielova. Although Mertens wasn't that bad, it was just Gabrielova was hitting winners and everything. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, there were two two points which uh, or three points which Mertens won, and the momentum was completely on the other side. And and Gabrielova was just going mental. She was screaming in the Empire once. I saw the match because 
uh, she was going to take a challenge for one of the points, but she she called the challenge too late, and the empire didn't want to allow the, to take the challenge, and she was going mental. And it actually, it got even worse then because you know sometimes when you react this way, it actually doesn't help you at all. Yeah, the for, crowd, for some, the crowd for, can turn yeah. against you, can't they? Yeah. Although although she's Aussie, so yeah. she's the home player, but uh, obviously it doesn't help even you to you know you should stay calm and concentrate and. Um, so yeah, that was one of the examples. Then I've got Caroline Wozniacki, who was playing, uh, Croatian Jana Fet. So, sorry for pronunciation. And she was, Wozniacki was almost out in that game. She was, it was 1-1, one, one, it was 1-1, one, one, yeah. And she was, it was, I think it was the same day that, uh, yeah, it was the same day that, uh, the Gabrielova match was taking place, so that was Wednesday. And it was 1-1 on set, and Fed was was leading in the deciding set 5-1. 5-1, and she was on serve, and she was, it was 40-15, so she had two match points and serving for the win. And she lost one, two, three, four, five, six games in a row. To lose the match in the deciding set 5-7. Wow, I mean, that's amazing for me. If you're winning 5-1 in the deciding set and you're serving and you're, you have two match points, 40-15, and you lose, well, that's bad luck. Another example from the women, from the men's tennis, just to, to demonstrate it, it's, it doesn't just happen in the women's game. And actually, it, it contained one of my, one of my bets on Prolipster. It was Jenny Shapovalov playing against Joe Wilfried Tonga. I had a bet on Shapovalov to win as an underdog. Shapovalov was uh, 5-2 up in the, in the deciding set against Tonga. And he lost. He was serving for the win. And he couldn't win a single game. And he lost 5-7. So that's just saying how how tennis... And that's the beauty of tennis in a way that uh, it can be so unpredictable and how the psychology works and you can, you can lose momentum very easily on one or two, yeah, two it's, points. It, it, it is, it is crazy. Like, to, uh, like, you know, I, I don't watch it as much as I used to, but I, I've told you why before, but, uh, um, you know, to be out there on your own and, and to be losing like that and then to come back like it must take so much mental strength but on the other hand as well for the other person to lose after being in such a, a, a uh, having such an advantage over the other person it, it, like it, it must really really screw with your head because it's not like um, I had a conversation with someone before saying like tennis, tennis I think tennis would improve uh, well, for me, watching tennis would improve if they had like, uh, if they had like a boxing coach, uh, mm. on it, you know? So like, you know, like, like, I, I love that part of boxing when, when they have the break during the round and they go back and they sit with the coach and you hear the coach like swearing and going crazy and just like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do that, that. And, and I think just, just, just because, uh, I'm, uh, I have happy memories of watching WWF growing up, and it was all the theater of it I loved, you know. So uh, I think mm. it would just be hilarious if you had like tennis coach just saying, "Nah, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you got to get out there." Nah, 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 nah. But but the thing is, like, tennis is such a lonely sport because you're out there, you're losing, you don't know what's going wrong, and all you have is your is that voice in your head, and it's saying like. You know, it can be like one of one of two ways. It can be like you're useless, you're losing because mm. you're useless, or else it's saying like you should be winning this. Pull it together. Uh, you know, it must be it must be crazy to play tennis at that level. Yeah, talking about coaching, there was a funny story in round one of the Australian Open. It was Dominika Tsibukova of Slovakia playing uh, Kaya Kanepi of Estonia. My friend was a dead game. Uh, working a dead game as a journalist, and he was telling me that uh, Sibulkova, uh, she had a, her husband in the players' lounge uh, during the match, uh, and she, her husband is known for cheering for her all the way through the match, and he's like shouting and you know supporting her. And the empire, huh, uh, the referee thought that it's her coach so she gave so she gave her because coaching in in tennis yeah. is uh, for, forbidden yeah. during the match 
So she gave her a warning for coaching. And in Sibuku, I was like, but come on, it's my husband. (laughs) (laughs) If you have any betting questions you'd like to ask, don't be shy. Get in touch with Patty, Martin, or Dan on Twitter. Protipster IRL, Protipster EN, or Protipster DAN. Or on Facebook at Protipster UK. Uh, Johnny, how are the the favorites getting on then so far? Yeah, so from the favorites we mentioned in the first podcast, Nadal is showing really well. He seems he's fit. Uh, he's he's got his usually usual good movement and his forehand is really really doing well. His serve is working as well. So I really like Nadal. I really like Federer, and sometimes his the speed of his serving games is you know the dur- duration of his serving games is just it's just mental. He just wins the ga- games quickly in, in four in four points, you know. Uh, quick as possible, and that's quite difficult for his opponents. But he had a difficult uh, matchup in uh, round two against Straub. The, the German guy was playing really well, but he got get on. And for me, Federer and Nadal are, as I said earlier, our favorites to win it. But Djokovic is uh, showing some very positive moments. He seems to be very strong mentally. It's not easy to come back after more than half a year. Uh, his elbow seems to be doing well for now. Uh, he's also serving re- really, really solidly, strong forehand. So these three guys from the men's draw are the obviously they are the usual picks, but uh, they're really good. But and then we have to say other uh, mention other guys like Alexander Zverev, who so far showed positive moments. Uh, Dominic Thiem had a difficult match in round uh, two when he was playing Dennis Kudla from USA. He was losing two 0 Two, two sets. He was two sets down, and he made a comeback and won the match three two, which might help him. Obviously, he didn't play that well in the game, but it might help him, you know, mentally to just to prove that he can even uh, do a comeback if needed. As for the women's, well, obviously we mentioned Wozniacki, who survived the scare of uh, almost going out. She was one point from going home. Uh, Simona Halep twisted her ankle in the first match against uh, Ayava. Destiny Ayava, but she seems she she played really well in the second round and she seems to be all right. She washed away Eugenie Pushard in 65 minutes, and she will be the number one after the tournament still. So that's positive for her. Uh, so we are these two, but Elena Svitolina uh, was also playing well. She eliminated it at the, just uh, this night. She eliminated the 15-year-old wonder girl uh, Kostyuk. So these three are for me the favorites for the women's. And we have got back the screaming lady, Maria Sharapova. <laughs> uh, she's also played really, really good. Uh, she was, she had her momentum. So in, in the round two. So let's uh, see who, have, who can win it. Have, have people, have people, you know, forgiven her? I suppose uh, it's, it's a weird um, thing. This is, since the whole drugs thing or, or, you know, how, how was, how was the tennis fans reacting to her being back? Uh, obviously this is a very difficult question because some people might consider it as a, you know, some people say that, uh, they would never forgive her or, uh, it's, I think it's everyone's personal opinion, uh, that matters. Uh, from my point of view, we can all make a mistake. It's easy to say that no one makes a mistake, but we, we all do make mistakes. She, she admitted uh, she did what she did. Uh, I think she regrets. Uh, I don't think she was any, she was much, fa- much favorite in the, on, amongst the players and fans. Well, amongst the fans, yes, but amongst the players before neither. So, uh, she has her own ways, but, we cannot rule out anyone, even after such a scandal. I mean, she she now she has to prove that she learned a lesson. Uh, she has to show that uh, she's strong mentally. She can handle all the pl- all all the pressure. But uh, let's see how, how she how she how she does. Uh, best of luck to her. Mm-hmm. All right. Fair. Have there, have there been any any uh, other you know big surprise or someone that stood out for you that that you weren't expecting to to play so well? Well, there were some surprises that of the uh, big players or big yeah guns in the, in the tennis that, that we ruled out. Uh, we got uh, 
obviously on day one, Venus Williams knocked out by Belinda the Bencic. You've got this 15-year-old girl, Kojic, uh, making her all the way through to, to round, uh, three. You know, she could actually still play in the juniors, uh, juniors tournament. I mean, she will not play, she will not play, but, uh, theoretically. She's, she's, she's really young, but she said in an interview that she's not going to play in juniors, uh, or she's going to try to stick with the women's, women's tennis now. And that, that's, that's the best way, she, that's the best thing she can do. She proved she can compete with the, in, in the adult tennis and the women's tennis. So that's what she should uh, build on. We've got Wawrinka out. Uh, that was a big surprise. He played the American Sandgren. Uh, it was, he was three sets to, 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 to nothing. But we have to say it was six two six one six four for Sandgren, and but it was very obvious that Wawrinka is not very fit. He he was struggling with the movement. He looked in certain points of match that he is giving up, but then he you know his his this is not his style. He then he fought back because he really likes this Grand Slam, so he's the winner from 2014. But you could see that he's struggling, so it's not it's not. Really nice things to see if a player wants to, but in he cannot. Case, in a case like that, though, Johnny, he he should throw in the towel though, because he's just gonna, um, he's just gonna end up further injuring himself. It's like uh, I don't know if if you know this uh, story about Roy Keane. He used to complain about uh, uh, Ruud van Nistelrooy when they played together at Manchester United. He all he used to think that van Nistelrooy was a bit a bit soft, a bit of a bit of a pansy because he wouldn't push himself. But the thing is, mm-hmm. van Nistelrooy had a had a had a longer career than Keane because he looked after his body much better mm. you know so yeah, I can see your I can see your point and uh, I cannot I cannot completely disagree but then you obviously have to think also as as the player would think that he's uh, the Australian Open in the Grand Slam and the Grand Slam is the peak of the tennis oh, of course uh, of course see this is the thing it's 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 in your mind again it's all psychology it's it's this pride thing that you don't want to give up but in fact, yeah. you, you, you know, really, you need to swallow it uh, and and say, no, look, I need to look after my body because I want to be able to play for six months longer, or a year longer. Yeah, that, you know. Yeah, true, true, true. Uh, I think he's going to take some time off after after this tournament to to, to completely recover, and then he's going to come back uh, come back uh, stronger. I, I'm pretty sure he's a big fighter, and uh, he's going to prove his qualities. Like we can we can mention Serena Williams again. Uh, she she was supposed to defend her title, but a few weeks before the tournament, she decided that she is not yet ready after giving birth to, to a child, and so she assessed her own form and own fitness not to be ready yet for the Aussie Open, which is uh, fair enough. Uh, she made a tough decision. Uh, definitely, it was not an e- easy decision, but uh, she made it and. We need to respect it, and uh, I also have a big respect towards these players who, who can make such a decision. Because, as you said, uh, she she could probably come and play a few matches, and then. But if she doesn't feel comfortable, then I think it was a very wise decision. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, speaking about surprises, just briefly, we've got uh, Gabi Muguruza, the number th- uh, the number three seed in the women's draw, who was beaten by. Su Wei Hsieh. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't pronounce this, this name. It's very, very difficult. But yeah, it was a big surprise. We've got David Goffan, number seven of the women, of the women's draw. He was, by, I've read some articles and some information that some people and some exp- experts pre- pre- predicted that he could go really far in this tournament. He was knocked out by, in round two by French veteran, uh, Julio Beneteau. Uh, after four sets, obviously uh, Joanne Conte uh, was it was eliminated by the number 123 in the world, Bernarda Pera, which was also, was also a big surprise. But again, I would uh, I wouldn't uh, overvalue this this uh, win of uh, Pera. I, I'm not sure Conte was uh, 100% fit because there were some rumors before the tournament about her fitness and. Uh, so this is for the surprises. There were some, uh, the Americans didn't really do well. Jack Sock, John Isner, both were out in round one. So we've got a few surprises. Obviously we've got still the biggest guys in the, in the men's draw in Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, Dimitrov, uh, 
TM's Vero. So for the men's draw, uh, let's say the biggest the biggest favorites are still in. For the women's, uh, except of Muguru, we've got Muguruza number three out. We've got Williams number five out. Then I think Conta was number nine. Coco van der Weeg was, uh, I think in top ten as well. So quite a few from the top, from the top players in the women's draw, but that's, that comes back to what we were talking about, the unpredictability of the women's game. For the weekend, uh, what are, what are the big ones that you're going to be watching? Yeah, for, for, for the, for the Saturday, for, for the night of Saturday, uh, there are some interesting matches, uh, to look at. Uh, I've been, I've been thinking about, uh, them quite, obviously, I have to say it's, uh, it's a bit early. It's a bit early to to talk about the <coughs> to, to talk about some some picks, so, but I will I will just say what I think about these matches and uh, uh, who I, who I'm looking at. So uh, early picks, I would say I'm looking at the Angeli Kerber that plays Maria Sharapova. I would give edge to Angeli Kerber. She she is the former world number one. She <coughs> sorry, she had a Quite a bad season last year, but she seems to be really doing well so far in 2018. Obviously, Sharapova is is uh, is on fire. Uh, she played really well in the round two. She's determined to prove their uh, her critics wrong, and the case we were talking about earlier. But I would give it to uh, to Angeli Kerber. But. Uh, I will I will assess these once again in the evening, and then I will come back with some um, with some definite picks for, uh, and I will share it on social media. I was looking also at Alexander Zverev to beat Chuchang. Uh The odds are not super great; it's more maybe even for accumulators, but the odds are around 1.5. But I expect Alexander to win. And then for a surprising, for a surprise, I'm looking at Sosnovich, which is a women's uh, women's draw game against Garcia. Garcia is a top ten player, but Sosnovich was playing really well and she had a really good start to the 2018 season. And I'm looking at the plus 3.5 Asian handicap on Sosnovich. I expect it to be in three sets, which would probably do well for this for this pick. Some of the highlights, if we look generally onto the matches of Saturday's program, Sharapova against Gerber from the women's game definitely. And we've got Ber- Thomas Berdik, former, uh, uh, top 10 player against Juan Martin, Juan Martin del Potro. That should be a good match. And I expect that one to be, that one to be a really, really long match because both can serve well. Both can hold their uh, game, uh, games and serve. So, uh, both are experienced in this level. Uh, I would give slight edge to del Potro, but, uh, then, when it comes to a long game, I, I'm not so sure. So, because this can easily last for three or four hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard to call then. Uh, look, something, something you said regarding the, the, the Zherev and, and, and Chung match. Um, <clears throat> you said that, that the odds aren't great. So when, when you see that the odds aren't great and, and you're kind of favoring someone, would, would you just keep an eye on it in play? And if they start badly, then you'd put money on them or, or if they're starting badly, do you just say, Oh, I'm glad I stayed, stayed away from it? Uh, depends. Uh, I, I don't, pre- I don't prefer personally in play betting. Uh, but I can see why some people do. And for tennis, uh, of course, it can be one of the strategies. Uh, if, if a favorite starts badly, then you, know, the, the, the odds rise a bit. But then I think it's all about what we spoke about earlier is finding the value, pricing the matchup yourself. Uh, the, pr- the probability of each player to win, and then if the price uh, then comes up as a value, then then you go for it. So as I said, the the price was very one point five. It's nothing, nothing. To, it's not not really even a value probably. Mm. It's just uh, I think that he's too strong for uh, for his opponent. So that's why I, I would suggest maybe for uh, for a small accumulator of two players or something like that. So. That's just that's just an early thought. Yeah, fair enough, that's all right then. Um, so look, I, I think that's it then, isn't it, Johnny, for our uh, for our, our second tennis podcast here from Pro Tipsters. So uh, yeah, if you could just give us uh, reminders then of where we can find you on the internet. So you can find me on Twitter as Pro Tipster Johnny, and you can find me on Facebook as uh, Pro Tipster Johnny as well. 
good stuff. And you can find me, Pro Tipster Pod. And we're also on uh, Facebook. You can get in touch with us. Just have a look for, for uh, Pro Tipster UK. So that's it then for me and Pro Tipster Johnny. Um, we'll be back on... Actually, I'll ask you now. We're going to be back on... Oh, no, you're away, aren't you? Yes, I'm on my way. So probably we'll be back uh, in a few weeks' time. Ah, oh, it was and it started off so well, huh? But fear not... Tennis fans, we will be back. We were, we're, uh, we're delighted with the response we've been getting. Or sorry, that we've gotten with the first podcast. So we'll definitely keep doing these anyway. So we'll be back in, in a couple of weeks once Johnny's full and rested and after winning loads of money at the Aussie Open. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it from us. Make sure and check out Pro Tips as well, where, uh, you can uh, earn money by sharing your winning sports tips. And get over there and have a look. And even if you're not good at tipping, there's loads of people over there who are, and they'll be able to point you in the right direction of where your money should be going. So that's it from me and Pro Tips to Johnny. We'll speak to you soon. Good luck. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out ProTipster.com, where you can earn money by sharing winning football tips. Check us out on YouTube and Instagram. Our handles there are ProTipsterGlobal. Or get in touch on Twitter. Pro Tipster E-N or Pro Tipster I-R-L. Bye.